you guys are back in the old school. Hey guys, I'm the Retro Reject, and I don't think this video needs a very big introduction because I'm pretty sure most of you know how I feel about anime and the reasons why I don't talk about them that much on this channel. It's because most animes aren't retro and the whole point of this channel is to talk about things that are retro including things that I remember and did in my own childhood and then just bring them back to the now. But the whole thing about childhoods is that most people can stretch them to the age they are now, including me. So those childhood years would include when I actually was an anime weeb. Yeah. Shocking, I know. But it started around my freshman year of high school, and it lasted until my sophomore year of high school. Pretty short, but during those years I was obsessed with anime, and I developed a few anime crushes. Or, as other people would call them, waifus. I want to make this one thing perfectly clear. During my weeb years, I wasn't one of those people who bought those anime body pillows or those little statues of my favorite characters or even pretended that my anime crushes were real. I was just a casual anime watcher. And for all those people who are extremely obsessive over their waifus, I only have one question for you. Are you insane? So, for today, I wanted to talk with you guys about a couple of animes I've watched, and as well as reveal a couple of those anime crushes I've had. But if I were to talk about all the animes I've watched so far, this video would be a lot longer than it is now. So what I'm going to do for you guys is that I'm just going to give you a quick run through of all the animes that I can't talk about today. So let's go! Now, with this first anime, I'm pretty sure this was the first anime that any kid was exposed to. I mean, yeah, it's to be expected that Pokemon would be the first anime I've watched. In fact, it's just literally a big thing for any child who watches it. Now, I wasn't born in the early 90s when Pokemon was kind of at its peak with Indigo League being out. It was around the time when uh, Pokemon Diamond Pearl came out. That was around 2006, so I was five at the time. Aside from that, I was still able to be exposed to Indigo League because my family already had like uh, VHS tapes and DVDs of Pokemon movies, which were uh, Pokemon the first movie, AKA Mewtwo Strikes Back, and then Pokemon 2000, and then Pokemon Heroes, which is my favorite Pokemon movie of all time. And then for the actual episodes, um, okay, kids, back in the day, we used to go to these little stores that would allow you to rent out uh, VHS tapes and DVDs of movies and TV shows, which you would bring them home to watch, and then a couple days later, you would have to bring them back. Truly dark times we were living in. Specifically, the rental store was called Hollywood Video, and we would rent out like some of the Indigo League episodes of Pokemon, in which a couple of them were like the one where Charmander was introduced, I think it was called uh, Charmander the Lonely, Lonely Pokemon, and then uh, Make Way for the Squirtle Squad, which was where Squirtle was introduced, and then Bulbasaur in the Hidden Village, which of course that's when Bulbasaur was introduced to Ash Ketchum's team. And just for any of you who want to know what my own personal Pokemon team would be, well, first my starter would be Squirtle, which he, he's a water type, which then he would evolve into a War Turtle, and then finally to my man Blastoise. And then my second Pokemon would be a Slowbro, who's a Psychic type. My third Pokemon would be a Pyroar, specifically a female Pyroar, because <coughs> no, <coughs> and she's a Fire type. My fourth Pokemon would be uh, a, a Golem, 
who is a rock type, and then my fifth Pokemon would be a Raichu, who is an electric type, and then my sixth Pokemon, I went with Arbok, who is grass slash poison type. As for my anime crush from Pokemon, the person I had a crush on was Dawn from Pokemon Diamond Pearl. And I know what you're thinking, and it does sound weird, because right now, I'm 19 years old, and Dawn is 10 years old. FBI, open up! Let me explain. When Pokemon Diamond Pearl came out, I was five or six years old, and the only reason I liked her was because I thought she looked cute. And another reason I like to think to myself is if I was actually within the Pokemon universe, I would be roughly the same age as the other characters. So I would be probably 10 or 11 years old in the Pokemon universe. Now, I'm going to have to go into a little more detail about Dawn, because just because I said she looks cute really doesn't mean anything when literally any other anime character is drawn to look cute. So, in Pokemon Diamond Pearl, Dawn doesn't want to be a Pokemon master or wanting to catch them all. She wants to be a Pokemon coordinator, which... In, this, in the universe, it's kind of like being one of those dog trainers who show off their dogs at dog shows, as well as being sort of a fashion model. But instead, in the, in the Pokemon universe, it's you're showing off your Pokemon. Now, the reason why she wants to become a Pokemon coordinator is because her own mother became a top coordinator, so she wants to follow in her mother's footsteps. And that is something I really do admire about Dawn, She'll stop at nothing to achieve her dream. And I think that's pretty much the pure essence of Pokemon. It's young children wanting to achieve their top dreams. And she is really passionate about this and loves doing it. It's just that the only downside to that is pretty early on in the series, whenever she lost like one of those contests, she really felt bad about herself. And she didn't think that she was good enough up and really got upset with herself and and she felt jealous about anybody who made it further into the contest. On the upside of things, some other reasons why I liked Dawn and the reasons why I think I had a crush on her was that she was really supportive of her friends. Whenever Ash got down in the dumps, she would be the one to cheer him on and cheer him up, as well as just being really good friends with Brock. Also, I just kind of found it funny that her Baneri fell in love with Ash's Pikachu. Now, out of all the other anime crushes I had, I think Dawn is the weakest because since I was introduced to her when I was five, I had no concept of what it was to actually like a girl. Now, the second anime we're going to be talking about was the first anime I watched during my weeb years. Well, and... It can be a little bit of a shock because we're going from something that was kid-friendly as Pokemon to... Yeah, a pretty drastic change of how mature you have to be to watch this anime because this is more meant for a PG-13 audience because, like I said, it's a lot more mature and it is pretty graphic. But hey, there's rarely any fan service, so that's a plus for me. It's just the thing is that I, I couldn't stick with this anime for that long because the whole concept of this anime is that Humanity behind, hides behind three walls to escape these creatures called titans, which are human-looking, but they're extremely gigantic, and they eat normal-sized humans. And if I'm telling you the truth, they're basically glorified zombies. At the beginning of this anime, this giant colossal titan breaks through one of the walls and allows the other titans to get in, in which then, of course, they start eating people which sends the main character, Aaron, on his mission to wanting to kill every single Titan he comes across, 
So he and his friends, Mikasa and Armin, join essentially the military in this universe, and which is divided, in, divided into three factions. The first one being the Wall Garrison, uh, the second one being the military police, and then the third one is the Scouting Regiment, which are the, is the team that actually goes out and kills Titans. Now, the only way you can kill a Titan is by wearing something that's called ODM gear in the universe, which basically allows you to fly around all over the place and look badass. And then you also have these two swords, which you have to slice the back of the neck of a Titan in order to kill it. Now, I really had a big interest in the first arc of the season, which was the Trost arc. And then I started losing interest just when it was the female Titan arc. And if you didn't know, there's very few people within the universe that can actually transform themselves into Titans. That includes Eren. And it's revealed that one of the other cadets in Attack on Titan named Annie can transform herself into a female Titan, even though it's pretty obvious just from looking at the both of them. Now, in terms of my anime crush within Attack on Titan, uh, you might as well call me Rose from the Titanic because... I had a crush on a character who died in episode 5 of season 1, and that was Mina Carolina. Now, she was only in about three episodes with very little screen time, but for some reason I just found something attractive within her. She seemed to be a very nice girl, and considering that she, it appeared that she was friends with Annie, it seemed like she was a person who would be very easy to, like, easy to get along with. Another reason is that she seems to have a sense of humor, because in one scene, she, it looked like she was trying to prevent herself from laughing after Mikasa uh, tried to hide the fact from the drill sergeant that Aaron and Jean were fighting by blaming it, blaming it on Sasha, which is another character in the anime. The last reason is that she has a sense of honor and doesn't want to let her teammates down, because in her final moments before she got killed by a titan, um, she, she and the rest of her teammates within Aaron's group went after him to save him because he went a little bit crazy trying to chase after a titan who ate one of his teammates, but he just ended up getting his leg chomped off by another titan. And so Mina... Mina wanted to save him, and even though she could have very well just have been like, You know what, I don't feel like dying today, so why don't we just stand here? And those are qualities that I just admire, and what makes me think I had a crush on her. And even though she was killed off pretty early on, my crush for her is a lot stronger than how I felt about Dawn. Okay, this third anime, I highly doubt most of you have heard of it. Yeah, this anime is pretty obscure. Uh, well, at least I think it is. And in my anime weave years, I thought if the more obscure animes I watched, the cooler I would be. And boy, I was wrong. Now, the anime Love Hina is pretty simple in concept. So when the main character was a kid, he made a promise to a girl that he would meet her again and when he's in college at Tokyo University, and he felt like this was the only girl he had truly fallen in love with. So as he gets older, his grandma tells him to help her to run an apartment complex because she's either going on vacation or something. And, but it turns out this apartment complex is filled, filled with nothing but girls, and there's like six of them, that, six of them there. There. So every episode, each girl finds a way to either physically or mentally abuse him, and just because they think he's being a pervert when he does something. So I find Love Hina to be a pretty decent anime, I, and I do really enjoy some of the episodes and their whole concept, because some of the episodes' topics range from something that's pretty realistic, and then some uh, episodes are just pretty much over-exaggerated, and one example of an over-exaggerated -exag episodes has the main focus being on my anime crush within Love Hina, and she is Matoko Aoyama.
Now, although I said Matoko is my anime crush within Love Hina, a close second is a girl named Shinobu, but if I was actually within the Love Hina universe, I would attempt a relationship with Matoko, because as evidenced by her sword, she holds pretty close values for herself, like being calm, collected, and respectful, polite, and just being an, an all-around badass. And the only reason she would be angry with you is if you did something perverted towards her. But the thing is, is she's not one of those characters who, who doesn't let her emotion show. It's just she was brought up and trained to be a warrior, so she doesn't allow herself to get too over-emotional. But for me at least, whenever you see a character like that smile or even laugh, it seems like such an amazing thing because she rarely does it. She is also a bit more of a tomboy. She doesn't like the standard girly things that the other girls within the apartment complex like. And the only time she lets herself get too over-emotional is whenever she's angry with Kentaro. And she literally blows you away when she's angry with you. And, and I'm not talking about like she threatens you with the sword when she's angry. She literally blows you away with the sword. And the other time she gets over-emotional is when she is afraid. And the only thing she's afraid of is turtles. Which brings us to the actual episode I'm going to be talking about. So as I said before, Motoko has a fear of turtles. And I wouldn't blame her when you see the turtle within this anime. It is so weird. So it ends up in Motoko's laundry, which then ruins all of it. But she doesn't have any clothes for the rest of the week. So all the other girls within the apartment complex try to get her, get her into new clothing. And she ends up with this dress that she doesn't feel like herself. And as evidence, she kind of loses all her badassery because she she tries to swipe at Kentaro, Kentaro with her sword, but he's able to do one of those fancy sword catching technique techniques by using his bare hands. And, and then even the turtle does it. But then the episode transitions randomly to a plot where they think that all, the turtle stole every electrical appliance within the apartment complex, so they go searching for it. And when they end up in the basement, they run into this mechanical robo-terminator turtle. Call it a Mecha Godzilla. Eh, not really. Like so, they try any, they try everything to try to defeat this mechanical Robo Turtle, and since it consumes all the electrical equipment, it just keeps growing bigger and bigger. And Matoko just wants to get rid of the clothing she's wearing now, but she kind of to try to defeat it. But she gets a stern talking to from Kentaro, basically telling her. Clothes aren't what define who you are. All right, so she gains back her badassery and is able to easily defeat the mechanical turtle. Yeah, that's Love Hina for you. As I said, it's a pretty decent anime, but it's just something I would only watch a couple of episodes of because I, I, just, I just don't like the whole harem concept, as I said. Uh, but my crush for Matoko was definitely a lot stronger, stronger than the previous ones I've talked about. And then Anime 4 came to me during my weeb years. Okay, I'm trying to remember, out of all the people I met during my weave years, who recommended me to watch this anime? It's me! It's me! Oh yeah, this anime 
is the kind of anime you would show somebody to for them to understand the basics of the concept of anime. In fact, I would call it the most cliche, stereotypical, basic anime that's ever existed. Because, I mean, think about it. The main character, whose name is Kirito, gets teleported to this virtual wor world, and he learns that if he dies in the game, he dies in real life. So he goes on this big quest from to get from point A to point B, and along the way, he becomes so overpowered, but he doesn't acknowledge it, and then... He meets his stereotypical love interest, who first hates him at first, but by the end is in love with him. And, and then also along the way, he meets several other girls who become a part of his harem, and, who, and they get a lot of fan service scenes. And dear gosh, I am not exaggerating, there is so much fan service in this anime. But I would call this pretty tame fan service. I mean, it, it doesn't get any worse, right? Right? No. No. No, 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 no! Okay. It's not the worst anime I have seen ever, but this is not a great anime. And I could go on and on explaining how I truly feel about it, but we don't have time, and I think it would be best saved for another video. But there's one more thing I want to talk about, and that's the whole thing about, oh, if you die in the game and you die in real life. It, it's, that's a, so, such a stupid concept. There's no difference between dying within a virtual world and then dying in real life to then to just dying. I mean... And the deaths within SAO, they're mostly of unimportant characters. I mean, think about other movies and TV shows that do death scenes like that. I mean, Mufasa's death from The Lion King, Spock's sacrifice from Star Trek Wrath of Khan, or even Iron Man's death from Endgame. But in SAO, all they do is turn into little shards. Despite all those problems and all the fan service, I, it didn't stop me from having a crush on one of the characters within SAO. Now, most of you would think I would say Lisbeth was my anime crush because she rarely has any fan service scenes and she was essentially the most normal character out of Kirito's harem. But her personality is equi equivalent to a brick wall. So my actual anime crush within SAO was actually of Asada Shino, AKA Sinon. Funnily enough, my close second for my anime crush was Sugua, a.k.a. Lifa, who is Kirito's sister. But there was only one problem with that. I'm in love with my brother. I'm in love with my brother. I'm in love with my brother. Yeah, so that's why I went with Asuda. Now, of course, she has her real-life appearance, and then depending on which game she plays... Her appearance is very similar, but they do differ slightly. Like, and there are different games that have been introduced throughout Sword Art Online. First, there was obviously the game called Sword Art Online, which was the whole thing about if you die in the game, you die in real life. And then there was Alpheim Online, which there nobody dies within the game to die in real life. It's just you have to respawn, in which she specializes in using a bow in that game. And then there's Gun Gale Online, which is the one she plays plays the most, in which she specializes in a sniper in that in that game. Now Asuda is a pretty calm and collected kind of character, and she is a bit more expressive and emotional when compared to someone like Matoko. Oh, but that reason is because of her past. You see, when she was a young girl, she and her mother was were caught in an armed robbery, and Asuda was the only one who was brave enough to actually stand up against the robber, which seen, uh, Asuda got a hold of the robber's gun, and she shot him three times, one in the stomach, one in his shoulder, and then finally one in his head. But as a result of that experience, she got PTSD from it, and her mother kind of started becoming a bit of afraid of her, considering of how easily she was willing to kill somebody. 
and when she was at school, she was teased and bullied for being a murderer. But, I mean, come on! She was doing it out of self-defense! And now, whenever she sees or holds a gun, she just starts to have a panic attack. And it doesn't have to be an actual gun. If somebody does something as simple as do, like, one of those finger guns, when she starts to freak out... And that's the reason why she plays Gun Gale online, so she can help herself get over her fear of guns and possibly cure her PTSD. And that's another reason why I think I had a crush on Asuda, uh, because I felt sympathy for her. If I was in the SAO universe, I would want to be the person who would be there for her and just be the shoulder that she can lean upon. And, and then let her make the choice if she wanted to pursue an actual relationship, because that same sort of thing happened within the anime, but it just turned it out, turned out the guy was just really in love with love with her, and she didn't feel the same way. Now, with anime number five, there's actually a pretty interesting story to tell with this one. So the story goes is that one day I was hanging out with my friend Arceus Rules, and I think it was his birthday that day, and this was once again back in my anime weeb years. Years, and it was late at night, and we had like he had several other friends over who are fans of anime, and we were just talking, and then we decided to take a couple of those "Who is your anime girlfriend?" quizzes that that are found on that are found online, and I wish I could have remembered what what quiz it was called, but I mean, there's so many of them. Uh, but I took at least two of them. One of them, one of the results I got was of a character that that didn't even exist within an anime. And then the second one I took was of a character that was in Guilty Crown. And so for the longest time, I wanted to figure out if this girl was, was my actual, would be an actual anime girlfriend of mine. And so, but for the longest time, I wasn't able to watch it because uh, Netflix didn't Netflix didn't have it. Um, I wasn't I didn't have access to Hulu yet, and, and just the whole like DVD box set for Guilty Crown was so expensive. And then when I finally got around to actual actually watching the anime, it turned out to be one of the most disappointing animes I ever watched. And I think that's just because of the reason I just overhyped it inside my own head. But I find now that this anime is actually sort of relatable to what's happening right now. Uh, because you see, the whole concept of this anime is that it's during, it's in a time of the world where there's a virus going around. And, but what this virus does is that it basically encases you with these purple this purple crystal like substance until it eventually encases your body and then you just disintegrate from it but just i could not get into this anime for very long long because all of the main characters were so annoying and it it, it just they weren't good characters or especially the main characters shu and inori in fact, the only reason I stuck around for this anime was because of my anime crush, Sugumi. There was also her friend, Ayase, and basically the two of them both created this reason for me to watch the anime because I did not want anything bad happening to them. But I would say that Sugumi was my anime crush. She has a very chipper and joyful personality, which is kind of odd because she works for a resistance, which you would think everybody would be very serious and then staying focused on the task at hand, uh, which she is, and she does get a little bit bratty towards people who aren't doing their jobs correctly. Like, but she's just a very fun person to hang around with, and she basically takes her whole job like it's a game. And 
what she does is that she's a hacker. And it does help the fact that apparently being a hacker in this world literally means you're playing a game. Okay, that last part was a little, a little bit cringy, I'm not gonna lie. But the thing is, is that I don't think she, she's not all joyful all the time because it's revealed that she was orphaned when she was very young. And she kind of lies to herself because she says that, oh, I've been alone for so long, I guess I just gotten used to it. But Shu's main power within the anime is to use things called voids where he can reach inside of a person and he can pull out some kind of weapon or tool from them. And Tsugumi's uh, void is that he's able to create duplicates. So that just kind of speaks to the fact that she does feel lonely and she wants people to be around her. Those reasons are why I think I had a crush on her because if I was in the Guilty Crown universe, each one of us would benefit from a, a relationship. She'll keep my spirits high even when times are at their worst, and I, in return, would give her somebody she can lean upon if she ever needs me. So that quiz was pretty spot on. Uh, now, on to our last anime, which is number six. So with past videos, I've already explained the whole concept of My Hero Academia, so I don't have to go really too far into it. This is just more explaining why I had a crush on Kyokujiro. So first, if you haven't noticed, uh, out of uh, the other, other girls I talked about having a crush on, there seems to be a pattern and a specific type I'm attracted to. And so, Kyoka Jiro, she, she appears to be somebody who really doesn't care about anybody, but on the inside she actually does really care about her friends, and she is a bit more, ex she is pretty expressive. And another thing is that she also is a little bit of a tease, especially towards Denki Kaminari, right? but that's just because he makes it too easy for her to make fun of him. She is also pretty chill and relaxed, and she also has a pretty interesting quirk, uh, basically having audio jacks attached to her ears, and if you attach them into a wall, you can hear any kind of conversation or any kind of sound that's happening within the area. And if she, and, and if she connects them to a speaker, she can amplify the sound of her own heartbeat, which then creating this loud, basically a loud sound. And if she inject, and if she plugs it into a person, it's a pretty big annoyance. But she is a bit insecure about some things about herself. Of One thing is that she doesn't perceive herself as attractive, and that's because the pervert of Class 1A, Mineta, always talks about how all the other girls in Class 1A are attractive, and, and he always leaves Jiro out of it. So she internalizes that as, oh, what, I'm not good enough for a pervert? And the, the second thing she's a bit insecure about is her own passion of music. She grew up around music at a young age, and then as she got older, she wanted, she realized she did want to become a hero, and she was worried that her parents was, or wouldn't approve of, it, approve of it, but they're like, no, go chase your dreams. So she's always now a little bit embarrassed whenever people mention she's really good at either singing or playing an instrument, and because she views it as a hobby, because she really wants to become a hero and she's got to put the childish things that she loves behind. But, but in the second half of season four, she learns that she can both be really good at playing music and being a hero too. So I think that about covers all the animes I can talk about for today and at least for a long while. And as well as I revealed all of my anime crushes, but 
The question is now, out of all the girls I have talked about today, if they all went into a death match with one another, who would come out on top? My friends, it's time that we get into... Did you honestly think I would let some anime girl win over my favorite Disney character of all time and my earliest childhood crush? Yeah, I don't think so. But in all honesty, I do want to hear your guys' opinions on who do you think would win a battle between Dawn and her Pokemon, Mina Carolina, Matoko Aoyama, Asura Shino, aka Sinon, uh, Sugumi, or Kyoka Jiro. So put it down in the comments, and while you're doing that, don't forget to like and like and subscribe, or whatever the heck you want to do, and maybe hit that little bell icon to get notified when the old school is back in session. But until then, the old school is out.